All right, so thus far we've talked about variables, operations on variables, built-in functions, plotting our own functions that we make, conditionals, and now we're going to be talking about loops. So what are loops? Well, loops are when you want to perform something repeatedly. So if you have some operation, like let's say you wanted to, to multiply by two a hundred times, you could do a equals whatever you want to multiply by two hundred times. So a equals three and then you could do a equals a times two a equals a times two again and just repeat this you could write it out a hundred times you could also do a equals a times two to the 100 Oops. 100 here but um let's say in this uh just for example sake you couldn't do this to the 100 and you want to be able to write all these out a hundred times um or you want to be able to do this without actually having to write it out well the way you can do this is with loops so with this for example you do a equals three and you could do a four for a while loop and we'll go into real quick what these are so for our loops we have a uh, for and while and for four four loops over something that you give it as an input so uh, in MATLAB because it's the matrix laboratory the main thing we're going to be looping over is a matrix so if you gave uh, if you wanted to for example let's say you have so you have the variable uh, a is 1 to 100 and I want to go through each of these points in the in the matrix that we just created each index here and print it out just display it in the command window the way I could do this is I could say a is 1 to 100 and then I can say 4 and then I make a variable that the loop is using for what it is iterating the value of so let's just say i'm going to call it n for now i'd say n equals a then i just n and then i end here when i run this what's going to happen is it'll go through and i said four this just initiates the for loop then I define some variable that's going to be specified in the for loop. If I want to call n now, it's still defined, but the for loop just tells it what it is. It changes this value every time you go through the for loop. So when I say for n equals, n is the variable that I'm going to be using that'll update in this for loop uh, equals a will tell it what it's going to update to. So the first time you go through this for loop, I run this and go up to the top. It uh, I've now suppressed A, so it goes for N equals A. And because it's looping, it just goes to the first position in A. And the first value in A is 1. So it'll say, OK, the first time we go through this loop, N is 1. So then we'll go disp and disp of n. We'll just display one here. And then it goes, it reaches the end. But in a loop, it can be confusing because the end isn't really the end of the loop. That's just saying, this is the point at which you circle back um, until you've gone through all the times you're supposed to. So now I've reached end, I circle back to the start and I go for n equals. And now uh, I already went through the first position in a so now the second value in a it will be two so now n will equal two as we go through this loop 
And so we'll just display n. And then we'll end. So we just circle back and we just go continue and go through. As you can see right here, we just went through every value in A, which is 1 through 100. So we got all those points and just displayed them. And you can run multiple lines in here if I wanted to disp n and disp n times 2, for example. It'll do that just fine. And what I'll do here is I'll do... Let me do a space here. So now it'll have a gap in between every circle of the loop here. So first it goes, uh, n is the first position in a, which is one. And then you display one and then you display one times two. And then you display a space it gives me an extra gap so I can more easily visualize this. And then it goes n equals two because it's the second position in a. And then it goes and uh, displays the two and displays two times two, which is four. And so it goes through. Just as you can have multiple lines in an if statement, you can have multiple lines in a for loop. So that's four. You just go through the values in some matrix. So you have the variable that's uh, changing every time you loop across. And once you reach the final value in A, you go through the loop one more time, and this end will just spit you out and you'll go through uh, the rest of the code just like normal. So that's four. Now we've got while. And here, if I wanted to do the same thing as this, uh, while look, works a little bit differently. And while is similar to a conditional with a loop combined. So basically what while does is you give while some test so this is the same thing as, as a if, like you give it a test if a is less than 100, for example. Then you do whatever you're going to do. And then you end, right? But with a while, it's a loop. So you just check this condition just like you would an if. And if the if would return true and do whatever's in here, then the while will do the same thing. It'll just do whatever's in the while loop. Uh, but instead of just ending at the end, just like for, it will then circle back, check this condition again. And while this condition is true, it'll just keep going, 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 going on. So, so if I give while true, this one, this will run forever because what it's doing is it will say, okay, while true well that's like if true that'll always be true right true is always true so then it will perform whatever's in here and then it will end so if i just had an if if true then disp one uh it will just do it once but with the while true it's going to run forever so you can see you can see this flickering down at the bottom here. That's just because it's keeping running. Uh, it's going more and more and more and more. So it's gone further than the size this command window allows. And so it just keeps printing out. And uh, that's why control C is a valuable tool. Because you can just stop it there when it won't stop. So uh, this is typically not what you're going to want to do. You're not going to just want it to run forever. So what you're going to do is you'll have like something you want to check. So if I say b equals one, and then while b is less than 100, disp one, then if I wanted to disp one, let's say I want it to disp 10 times, then I could say b equals b plus one. And what will happen here is I will define b because unlike four, uh, four has a variable that's changing every time. Um, while you'll have to change the variable inside the while loop, it doesn't automatically have this. It's just checking a condition. It doesn't update the value of anything. So you update the value in the while loop. So if I wanted to display one 10 times here, all I'm going to do is this because it'll go B equals one 
while b is less than 10, well, right now, b is less than 10, it's 1. So then it goes into here, it displays 1, and then it says b equals b plus 1, and end. And I reach the end, so I circle back, and while b is less than 10, well, b is now 2, but that's still less than 10, so it'll go through and keep doing it, and uh, it'll circle back 10 times, because... Oops, I don't want to show this. So... I'll have one, one here, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And only goes to nine because by the time I've gone the tenth time, it uh, checks if it's less than 10, it's not anymore. So I'd actually have to do less than or equal to 10 if I wanted it to go 10 times now. Because if we go with a lower number, uh, if B equals one, uh, we go into this, b is less than or equal to 3, so we do the while loop. We display 1, and then b equals 2. So we've displayed 1 one time right now. So if we keep a tally, here we are. Displayed 1 one time, and b equals 2 by this point. So now, while b is less than or equal to 3, 2 is still less than or equal to 3, so I display 1. That's one more in my tally right here. And then I update B to 3. Then I've reached the end, so I circle back and I check. Is B less than or equal to 3? Indeed it is, because it is 3. So it displays 1. Got another one here. And B equals B plus 1, so now B equals 4. And so now it reaches end, circles back. But b is not less than or equal to 3, so it immediately exits and continues on with the code like normal. So if b had been 4 right off the bat, it would just print out nothing, because it goes into this while loop, but it immediately fails the condition, so it just exits and continues on with the code. And there's nothing else here, so it just does nothing. So that's how for and while loops work. So let's talk about some common uses of for versus while because they're both loops they both perform the same uh thing they're similar to like if and switch right they both can be used in similar situations so why would you want to use one versus the other so typically what i find is you can in most situations always use either um the while is typically the one if you don't know what to do typically go with a while but the reason i usually use a four is because i know i want to go over this loop specified number of times like in the example from the start right we wanted to go we knew 100 times so i can just say i want to go through it 100 times so i make a matrix one to 100 four n equals a and i know immediately I'm going to go through it 100 times. So then for n equals a, and I could do, uh, I'll make this c, so I can stick with a equals 3. And then I could do a equals a times 2. And when I run this, uh, I multiplied it by 2 100 times. So. I got that, which if I a times 2, 100, I get the same thing, right? But if I wanted to achieve this in a loop, that's how I would accomplish it. So that's a good example of why I would want to use 4. I could use a while for the same situation. I could just say a equals 1, and then while is less than 100, and basically make a condition that will go through 100 times just like this. So a equals a plus 1. And now, except we know from 4, we'll need less than or equal to. But I'll do a equals a times 2. And end. Uh, except right here, I'm going to want c, right? c equals c plus 1. And a equals a times 2. So here's c. c is 1. a is 3. I'll run this and I'm getting the same thing out for a that I have before so we're able to accomplish it both ways but there's less lines 
for the four. So it's simpler just to do it often when you know you have a specified number of times that you're going through. And in particular, if you have a specific uh, matrix that you want to go through all the values, then you use a four. A while on the other hand, if you don't know exactly how many times you want to go through the loop, you don't know you want to go through it a hundred times. Let's say you just wanted to multiply it by two until you got to the point where a is a thousand, then you would do a while because you wouldn't know with the four how many times you needed to go through. Um, so basically when you have some condition you want to meet rather than to go through something so many times, then you'll go with a while loop. Another useful thing is break. And what break does is when a loop gets to a break, it will immediately stop the loop uh, and exit. It'll go to the end and then continue on with the code. So if I had four n equals one to 100 and a equals, say a equals three, a equals a times two, but we wanted to check that uh, we weren't going above a is a thousand, for example. We could say if a is greater than 1000, then break. And that if and that for, when we run this, a is 1536 instead of uh, four. 3.8 times 10 to the 30th. And we could check how many times it's actually gone through because n right now is nine. So it's only done the loop nine times. And it just, on the ninth time it went and a got to be greater than a thousand. So once this is true, it goes in, breaks it, and the break breaks it out of the for loop. And so it immediately goes to for loop end and exits. So yeah, that's a valuable tool that allows you to use a for loop a lot like a while. Um, and just instead of having a innumerable number of times, right, this while can go on forever. So if you wanted to just have this at maximum go a million times, then you could say or other variable is one to one. Then we could say C, C equals C plus one and A equals A times two and A equals three and C equals one. Then if C is greater than 100 because we want it to be opposite of this so instead of less than or equal to we have the opposite is greater than so if c is greater than 100 then break end and this will do the exact same thing in the end because it, we're not going a million times through this loop but if we wanted to make sure that this loop didn't go on forever and we wanted to cap it out at a million times then this is how you would accomplish that is basically using a for loop with a while loop or you could say with this, you could do a condition so that, uh, let's say, n equals one, and every time we go through this, n equals n plus one. So n is how many times we've been through it. Then we say n is less than one million. Uh, this and, because while loop is just like an if, statement except it loops every time it's true because of that we can uh, use complex conditions like this and yeah when i run this it'll go uh, they'll all return the same thing so there's lots of different ways to accomplish the same thing but uh if that's what we wanted to do is cap it out at a million times then there are many ways to do that uh, you can also like with this you can put if statements in for loops 
You can put if statements in while loops. You can put for loops in if statements. So let's say right now we had if a is less than 10,000, then for n equals 1 to 100, a equals a times 2. So we want to stop when it gets to be greater than 1,000 and then only do it, uh, say, 10 more times. Then we could end that and that. So now, now we went uh, 10 more times past the, whatever it was here, 1536. 10 more times past that is 1,572,864. So that's what happens when we put loops inside if statements. We just check. We go from the top to bottom and uh, you can see this minus sign will shrink a statement. So it'll just, everything enclosed in this statement will be shrunk, but it's just for you visually. It doesn't change anything in the code. As you can see, this is still line 83. It's got the lines 81 and 82. It's just hidden them for, for you. But the way this is working is it just goes in, goes into this if, starts, checks if A is less than 10,000. It is indeed. Great. Uh, and then we go through everything in here until we reach the end. And uh, because it's a loop, we'll loop in here before we reach the end. But that's fine. We'll just keep doing that. And then we'll get to this end. And be it's not a loop. It's just an if. So we'll just exit just fine. We could also have else, just like we could normally, and run everything totally normal like that. You can also have loops in loops. And we'll go into a main reason why you'd want to do that, but let's look at the simpler example first. So one main thing that you want to do with loops, something that I use a lot, is let's say A is some random numbers, thousand of them, from zero to 100. Let's call this our data on temperatures for the day. And let's, let's actually say instead of a thousand points, we'll have 60 minutes in an hour and 24 hours in a day. So size of A will be 1440. So we got 1440 points because that's our number of minutes in the day. So we just record the uh, temperature every minute and we want to see we also have a time matrix and this will be just be the number of minutes so 1 to 1440 right and this just corresponds if I plot time versus a oops once I run this of course I'll just do it in here clear so let's see close all and Plot I am versus A. I've just got a bunch of noise here, but I've got each each of these points. That's my my time in X, 103, and my temperature in Y. So goes from zero to 100. So let's say I want to find the first temperature that's greater than 90. Let's say. I could use a for loop for this, right? I could say for uh, temp equals, and let's call this temperatures. And of course, I'll have to change this then, temperatures. So temp equals temperatures. We'll just go through and first, temp will be the first value in temperatures, then the second, then the third, then the fourth, so on. So I want to see if temp is greater than 90 uh then excuse me just break and so now i see the first temperature that's greater than 90 is 98.3421 but that doesn't tell me where and i'll run it again here 98.841 or 8431, there we go. That's the first temperature greater than 90. 
but that doesn't tell me when it is. So the way I could do that is instead of using a for loop with temp equals to the temperatures, I could say I want to go through all the points in temperatures. And here I could say for n equals one to length of temperatures. And this just tells me how long because temperatures size of temperatures is 1 by 1440. It'll just return the greater of these two with length, right? Which is 1440 in this case. So we'll go from 1 to 1440. And then I'll say if temp is greater than 90, break. But I don't have a temp now. I've got an N. So what I'm doing now is I do temperatures of N. And that looks at the position in temperatures that I'm iterating through with n. So n is the position, not the actual temperature now. So temperatures at that position is greater than 90. Then I want uh, temp first greater than 90 to be equal to temperatures at n. And I also want the time first temp greater than 90. And let me just rename this to look like that as well. First temp greater than 90. And time first temp greater than 90 is time of n. Now when I run this, I get first temp. Oh, except... Um, what I'm actually getting here is I'm going through and I say four n is one to length of temperature. So start at one and then check if temperatures at one is greater than 90. And if I look at temperatures one, that is not greater than 90. So it'll ignore this. It'll get to the end, circle back because it hasn't gone through all of the 1440 points here. So now I look at temperatures up to 80, still not greater than 90, 3, 4, so on, uh, until I finally get to a point that's greater than 90. But because I'm not breaking here, I'll just keep looping here until I get uh, through all of the points. So in reality, this will just return the last point that's greater than 90. So the time. Uh, not the first temp, the last temp greater than 90 is at 1460. Or no, not 1460, 1436. So 1436 looks like this one. And indeed, at time 1436 and at temperature 90.568. So that's the last temperature. But of course, for the first temperature, I'll need to update the temperatures and the time and break. So now the first temp greater than 90 is at 8. And that is right here. It's at 98.0139. And the temperature or the time at that temperature is 8. So that's why you would use a, a variable to iterate over and then look at the specific value at that position instead of doing uh, for n is just the temperatures. Temperatures there. So uh, there we go. You could, of course, reorganize this and use a while loop if you wanted to perform the same thing, but typically I prefer for loops. So another one here, let's say that you have a matrix and this is temperatures as well, but uh, here you have a number of rows, number of columns. So it's not just a vector. Instead, it's a whole 2D matrix like this. 
and got value one, two, three, and so on. Is that row one or uh, column one, two, and three? So what this is doing is it's got, to, let's say for this example, these are the machines. So uh, this is machine one in column one, this is machine two in column two, machine three in column three. And this is which day? So first day, second day, third day, fourth day. So let's make some random information to use as an example here. Iterating over multiple dimensions. So what we'll often do here is we'll have temps equal rand. Uh, and let's say we have five rows, which are the days. And these are the machines. So five days and let's look at 100 machines. Again, from zero to 100. We could say for t equals or temp equal temps. And we could go through all the values in temps and find the first one if temp is greater than 90. Uh, then first temp GT90. First temp. GT 90. Okay, so when I run this, you'll see it's not actually printing out time first temp GT 90. Um, and in fact, this wouldn't be the time, it would be the index. But the reason for this is it never had the condition temp is greater than 90. Uh, reason for that is if I hide this, print out uh, the temp so I can see what we're going through here. Uh, temp is a vector. It's going to be one column of temps because we got five rows, 100 columns. It'll just go through the 100 columns of temps and it'll say for temp equals temps and they'll say if temp is greater than 90 which we know if temp is greater than 90, it will look at if all of these are greater than 90. So at no point were all of them greater than 90. So it never updated this, but we probably don't want to look at all the columns or maybe we do. So that's how you do that. If you wanted to instead look at each of the machines and each of the days, the way you can do this is for row equals one, two, or uh, you typically do this is row column equals size of temps. And let me do it clear so it's it all here. I'll make this out real quick. So row call. Uh, row, we got five, call, we got a hundred. So typically what I do here is for R equals row and for C equals call. Then I can say uh, temps at row column, uh, R being the row I'm at right now, C being the column I'm at right now. And if that is greater than 90, then first temp greater than 90 is temp of 90. And index first temp greater than 90 equals time of 90. This wouldn't uh, totally make sense. This would be the day first temp is greater than 90. This would be R, because D is the row, and uh, the machine, oops, yeah, machine first temp greater than 90, 
is the column. So end, end, end. Close all those. And I can do a break, break. So now when I run this, find function temp, size of temps. So I got it temps here. Oops. Line 112. If temp of our C, here we go. That would have to be greater than 90. So when I run this, I get out. Let me first suppress these. Looks up for those. So now my first temp greater than 90 is 21.2597. The day there is five, and the machine we're talking about is the hundredth machine. So I just went through, and with the four r equals rho, I said, oh, whoops, my mistake. I wouldn't do rho, I would do one colon rho. And there we go. So now the day, uh, I said four r equals one to rho. So it goes from one to five. Uh, so first it starts row one, and then it checks in here. And it says four C equals one to 100, because I got 100 columns. So my right now my R is one, my C is one. And then it goes in here, F temps at R1, C1 is greater than 90. So temps one, one is greater than 90. That is not true. So it immediately exits and uh, reaches this end because it does this if. So gets to this end, continues, which is this end because it's a loop, circles back, and immediately goes to the next value. So it says C is now 2. Then it checks temps at 1, 2, because R is still 1. Uh, it's again not greater than 90. One, three, and it'll just keep going, right? And uh, if it hasn't found any that are greater than 90, by the time it's done, it will uh, end here because it's gone through all the fours and it'll reach back to here. And because we only got to the first point of R, we'll circle back and do the second point of R. And then we'll go and do every C in here again. So it'll go through that process. It'll do R is one, go through all the Cs, R is two, go through all the C's and so on. And uh, and there we are. So that's how we can get the information in multiple dimensions. And uh, a common thing to note here is you could do the loop of the rows on the outside and then the loop of the columns on the inside or vice versa. And why do you do one or the other is the question. So what this one is doing It'll look at R, look through every C for that R. So look at day one and find the first machine in day one that uh, has a temp greater than 90. So if that's what you want, then you do R on the outside and C on the inside. If you want reverse, then you do this. But that only matters if you want specifically to have like the first, for example. Um, if you wanted, say, to just collect uh, all of the sets of days and machines that were greater than 90, uh, it wouldn't matter which, which you do on the inside and which you do on the outside. You could just say first temp greater than 90, and you just want a matrix of all of the temperatures greater than 90. So you don't say first, you just say temps greater than 90, and you say, days temps greater than 90 and machines temps greater than 90 and these will start out as empty because we don't know any and then we go through and every time we find one we say temps greater than 90 of length of temps greater than 90 equals and what I'm doing right here, right? As I'm saying, 
Okay, at this temps greater than 90, it's got a certain size. It starts at a zero, but it's got whatever size it has at that time. And then I want the next position in it. So the first, when it's a size zero, first to be the first temperature that I find. So that, to fill that, and then days temps greater than 90 at length temps greater than, whoops, and this would be days temps greater than 90, plus one equals the row for the days. And of course I can do the same with the machines with C. So now when I run this, oh, I do length, not len. Now my temps greater than 90 is all of the temperatures in this temps matrix that are greater than 90. Because again, I just go through and every time I find a temp that is greater than 90, then I put in the position one further than the current size of it, the current length, um, the temperature. So I started out size zero and then I make it size one and increase it by one every time I go. So I put it in the next position and do the same with the days in the machines. And that way I can, uh, I can make that happen. Um, of note here as well, you can see this orange underlying the break, and this is just saying this statement and possibly following ones cannot be reached. So the question is, what is R and what is C right now? So R is five, C is 100. And why is that? Well, the way break works is if I pull up doc for break, Break is uh, exiting a loop before it's supposed to be done, right? But let's see here. Just give the rest of the instructions in the loop. In the next iteration, is continue. So another option is continue. So what a continue does is if I add more calculations down here, but I didn't want to do it unless this continue is not met. So if length of temps greater than 90 is greater than 10, then continue. What continue will do is it will continue applies to the uh, next iteration of a for or while loop and skips any remaining statements in the body of the loop for the current iteration. So it just immediately goes, if this is true, then instead of breaking out of the loop, it does a continue. And it, so it just goes to the end of that loop that it's in and circles back and does it again. Um, but it doesn't do the rest of the lines remaining in the loop for that iteration, whereas break stops circling back in the loop. So question is, if you have multiple loops, do you have to do multiple breaks? Or how exactly do you get out of two for loops? Because if I look at an R and a C here, I am at R equals 5 and C equals 100. So I haven't actually broken out. Like when I wanted to do the first temp I found, uh, it wouldn't successfully break out because it goes through all of them. Um, and the reason is because this break is immediately breaking. It doesn't get to this next break because it doesn't continue going through the code. So it goes break and it immediately stops this first loop. So how do we do breaking out of multiple loops at one time? What we'd have to do is we can, uh, if we wanted to break out once we find the first one, then we could say, uh, once we get into here, break, I'll break us out of the for loop. And we can say if temps greater than 90. And if this has anything in it, so if the length of this 
is greater than zero, then break, and there we go. And uh, a useful tool is sometimes gives us alternatives when it's smartly looking through our code. It says, okay, I just wanted to check if it's not empty. Uh, and indeed, that's one I want to check. So you can look at that recommendation from MATLAB and uh, you can click fix or just look at what it's recommending and update your code based on that. So in this case, I'll just fix it. And I want to check is not empty uh, this this uh, matrix here. So uh, in that case, I'll break and in this case, it looks like the I'm set one one is indeed greater than 90. So it broke out immediately. It went for C equals one, for R equals one. Then it gets here, breaks, and immediately exits that. And it is uh, not empty anymore because the first point was one. So I'll run this again. Now it's not at one exactly. It's at uh, days three machines one, and that's 97. So the first point I got to that uh, had a temperature greater than 90 was at day three, machine one, and I was able to successfully break out of that. But uh, you'll need to include breaks um, in each loop. So this will break it out of the first loop, and then you need another one for this outside loop when you want to break through multiple loops. So that's how that works, uh, breaking out of multiple loops and how you can iterate through multiple dimensions. Because I could iterate through if I had temps that had three dimensions. So it had a, uh, a depth here. So there's a bunch of layered 2D matrices one over another. And uh, this was the time, oops, time in the day, that uh, dimension there, then I could iterate through that as well. So doesn't matter, I would just add another for time equals one, two times, and speed times. Times right there. Let's put this in and add an extra end. And I would have to say another break. And this, and there we go. So now I could find the first one. I have to add number of times. Let's do 1440 again. So now we have the days, we have the machines, and we have the times. Times times greater than 90. Uh, so right here. Times is greater than 90 plus 1. It's time. And I would have to initialize this. Times times greater than 90. And the first one in this case, I'm going through all these, is the at day 5. Machine one time one, I reached greater than 90. So temps at day five, machine one time one, 95. So that's how you can do that. You can do many more dimensions, as many dimensions as you got in your matrix and just do nested loops like this and nested breaks if you wanted the first one, or you can comment these out and get all of them, right? And this is doing a lot of printing out, so I will hide this and then run it. And also, yeah, now that looks good. Now I've got my temps greater than 90. Has 72,000 columns, so that's why you wouldn't want to uh, print it out every time, because uh, at the end there, it's printing out 71,999 columns um, and time for that 71,998. So it's printing out a ton and 
it was printing out all of these. So that's a lot of uh, data. So you'd want to suppress them all. And then if you want to see them at the end, you could call them up here. But anyway, that's how that works with lots of dimensions. Okay, now let's say again, we're trying to see, because the cool thing with programming and the sometimes frustrating thing is there's a million ways to do something. So let's look at an example. Let's say we have something that we want to check and uh, we have certain scenarios. If that thing is zero, then we want to say case zero. If it's one, we want to say case one. If it's two, we want to say case two and so on and so forth uh, for five cases. Um, and then other than that, we want it to always say other case. So the way we can do this is we could say test param equals one. And then we could use switch case, right? Because we've got a bunch of cases here. Switch test param. And for the case of zero, we want to display case zero. For case one, we want to display case one. And so on. So we do five of them. So one, two three, four, and five. Then otherwise, display other case and this, that will do it, right? Uh, I could say this is random one and it goes from zero to uh, five. So I'll just round this. And it's one, so case one, two, three, five, three, case five, one, so on and so forth. That's one way to do this with a switch case. Now I can do it another way. I could do if, and I won't work through that. You could uh, figure out how to do it with if. If uh, test param equals equals zero, then this case zero, L if, else if, a test param equals equals one, and this case one, so on and so forth. Another option is another way of using it. If I could say if test param is less than six, then disp and case plus string of test param else disp other case and end it here. Now when I run it, it will do the same thing as before. Okay, perfect. So that may be a simpler way of doing that than before, uh, because we're just trying to print out some information um, with a prefix string, basically. So that's one way of doing it. We could also use a for loop. We could say for val equals one, two, six. If test param equal equal val, then disp case plus test param, then val equals val plus one, and this, and that. And if val equals six, then disp other case. So I gotta finish my end here. Okay, so in this case, what was test case or test param is one. So why didn't this work? 
Well, it did work. Uh, I just wanted, if it got to it, then to break immediately so that it didn't get all the way to six. So when I use the break, then uh, this will do the same exact thing as the other ones, right? Because it'll go through uh, all the one through five. If at the point in one through five, it's the correct one, then it'll display case that. Uh, then it'll say value equals value plus one. And the only reason I'm doing this is because at the end, on the final loop here, instead of circling back, right, when I'm exiting, I'll have val equals six because it's passed here. So if I haven't broken out and val has updated to six, then now I've got if val equals six, then display other case. And this is basically a way more complicated version of this. Uh, so you could just simplify it to this. This is just an... Um, unnecessarily complicated way of doing it, but this would totally work, right? It's just not as efficient of code. So you'd want to do something like this. So uh, that's a cool thing, a inconvenient thing, depends on uh, the way you're dealing with it. But yeah, if, uh, if you're trying to solve a problem in programming, there's tons of ways to solve it. So often you're focusing on what's fastest to code and what's fastest in actually running. All right, um, one more thing I want to talk about is find. So what find is, if I pull up the documentation, let's see, find of x, find of x, uh, find of x, n, and find of x returns a vector containing the linear indices, which are the positions just if I had a a is um, rand of two rows, three columns, it'll just be the indice, indices of it converted to a column vector, right? And if you just say find x, it returns the non-zero elements in x. If you say find xn, it returns the first n indices with non-zero elements in x. But the cool thing here, is that you can use, so I've got my a here, find a is greater than 100. This will be nothing because, or it'll be empty because none of these are greater than 100. But uh, if I said greater than 0.5, it's 2, 3, 5, and 6. So right here, uh, 2, 3, 5, and 6. Um, because it'll take all the columns and just stack them on top of each other. So two, three, five, and six are greater than 0.5. I can also say RC equals find A is greater than 0.5. And this will give me one, two, three, three for the column and two, one, one, two. So row one or row two, column one is greater than 0.5. So row two, column one, greater than 0.5, row one, column two, is greater than 0.5, row one, column two, and so on. So an easier way of doing something like this um, is to use the find, and it basically just goes through and checks all the positions in the matrix, and it sees, okay, I'm feeding in a conditional so this will be only it'll be one if it's true zero if it's false so anytime it's true here show me the row and column for that and uh there i can find it so find is a very useful tool to uh generate outputs for where certain things are true so find a is less than 0.5 for example row column then i can do that so very useful tool uh to perform a lot the same thing as what we had to do a nested for loops in this case to do this exact same thing as what we're doing here so very useful tool and uh hopefully you learned a bit and are understanding what loops are for uh go ahead and Practice a bit, come up with your own examples, make sure you understand how they work. And uh, thanks.